as being the last teacher, I have the joy of sort of wrapping up the weekend. We started with Steve James here talking about the foundation of understanding the church epistles. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, no other man. So if you want to know who is the man of God, that is it. Everybody else, so the minute somebody tells you something else, reminds me of that verse in the uh, uh, Gospels where Jesus Christ says something like, let no man, you know, call no man Lord. But a lot of people like to call somebody their Lord and Master in various religious organizations and other groups. But we don't. We have one Lord and Savior. Uh, many have Holy Spirit. So it, there isn't one person with Holy Spirit today. We all have it. Think of the difference between Moses uh, being the one guy getting revelation from God. And then when Paul went to Jerusalem, thousands of believers came out of the woodwork with revelation. Tell them not to go. He went anyway. But, but the point is, it wasn't one man of God. It was lots of people with the Spirit of God. Uh, and uh, we can do greater works than Jesus Christ did. We have the same Spirit, same Lord, same God. We're all members of the one body. We have the manifestations, your service, functions in the ministry, and gift ministries. And we should think soberly. We shouldn't think that we're so great. We should think about how great God is. Because so many times with people, it comes down to fight between who's the greatest person or the greatest group. Well, compared to God, none of us is. But God is great. So we don't have to worry about whether I'm smarter than you or you're more, you witness more than me or anything. It doesn't matter because God is so great. That's what matters. Um, and we should think soberly and we should be given the hospitality. And then, of course, Larry Laverm here, my old friend, uh, said to love the stuffers, but don't allow yourself to get stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of like old home week. Yeah, I now live in Virginia and he lives in Ohio, but for years we both lived in New England and saw each other play various parts in New England and and uh it's great being back here i did live in new england for four years and then uh got to come back many times to visit believers and teach so a little bit like old home week for me and then mike lawrence said something it's christ in you <laughs> yeah he probably did say a louder uh i talked about the great mystery and our identification with christ the all truth which was talked about in the gospels is written for us and guess what the church epistles we're joint heirs with Christ. We have the full measure of Holy Spirit, and we get the full measure of the inheritance. Reminds me of that verse where it says, God's going to be exceeding great rich, the riches of his exceeding something. The great riches of his exceeding kindness. And it's a great verse. I just don't remember. <laughs> but the thing I do remember is that our inheritance is laid up in heaven for us. I think about that. It can't be taxed. <laughs> and inflation's not going to hurt it it can't get rusty and wear out it's laid up in heaven a lot of other stuff you get might wear out or you might lose but not our inheritance it's laid up in heaven for us that was great um then he said we're in the apex we're living in the greatest time that ever was and that's true people love to talk about the good old days we have we've talked about times and various fellowships and the way ministry and that was great but I believe our greatest days are ahead and culminating in the return of the Lord, which will be really great. But I'm just expecting God to continue to bless us and take care of us in amazing ways. Think of everything we've done so far as a foundation. Now, what can we trust God to build upon it? And we'll just have to ask God to show us. And as many people have said, like Steve said, he was scared of teaching. There was a time I was scared to death to teach. And I just prayed that God would help me. And I took every chance I could to teach. And then after six months, I looked back and said, I'm not scared to teach anymore. <laughs> Same thing with witnessing. I was scared to witness. So I just prayed that God would help me not be scared. And I tried to witness every time I could. And then six months later, I looked back and said, I'm not scared of witnessing anymore. So we all can grow. God will show us. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And it's true. He'll help and then Bob Swan, he's absolutely hooked on, guess what, Romans 8. <laughs> absolutely hooked. And, and Romans came up in many 
mm -hmm. teachings, and I'll probably throw in a few myself today. <laughs> it, uh, it is the foundation of what's the first church epistle. So it starts, it has so many foundational things, and in many ways, the other church epistles elaborate mm -hmm. on it. Then, of course, you get to Ephesians, and a whole new day there, which is wonderful. So he's hooked on Romans 8. We are free. So if we carry any burdens, we put them on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Very important. I am young and I am strong. <laughs> the word of God abides in me and I have overcome the wicked one. And the truth shall make you free. Not just let you walk out the door. It'll sort of push you out the door. <laughs> the truth shall make you free. The world is waiting for us. Listen to the word and do it. And pray more in the spirit. And he had his movie that he liked because it talked about freedom of will. But the, uh, what was it? The uh, Adjustment? The, Adjustment Bureau. The Adjustment Bureau. My favorite movie about freedom of will is Bruce Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> it is really good. It talks about freedom of will. And I once got to, because of my the nature of my day job, the decade or two ago, I got to meet Morgan Freeman. And I asked him if it uh, was intimidating to play God in three movies. And he sort of looked a little shifty eyed, but said, no. <laughs> so we all have our movies we like. Romans, it's our Magna Carta. It's our Declaration of Independence. And it is. It shows how free we are from sin by the work of Jesus Christ. Then Mike Verdicchio, of course, taught on faithfulness. Uh, talked about how Moses, Jesus Christ, Timothy, Paul, God, other people were faithful. And we're supposed to commit the word to faithful men. And righteousness is a gift of God, and the just shall live by faith. That's the verse that turned Martin Luther from being a scared, confused monk. I think he's a Benedictine monk. I can't remember. But he's a monk and uh, in Germany and losing his faith and not sure he believed in God. He saw that verse, the just shall live by faith. And it turned him around and led to what ultimately became the... Uh, the, the Reformation. So we're not all Roman Catholics. <laughs> of course, there's that other old thing that a friend of ours used to say, roses are red, violets are bluish. If it weren't for Christ, we'd all be Jewish. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> well, if it weren't for Luther, we'd probably all be Roman Catholics. <laughs> Maybe not, but he had a big part of that. Um, <clears throat> So righteousness is a gift of God. The just shall live by faith. We hold fast the faithful word. We hold fast that which is good. God will reward us for our faithfulness and we should grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Charlie Quillen taught that Jesus Christ is our Lord and you keep Jesus Christ Lord by love. Keeping Jesus as Lord is a continual process. The seal is the Holy Spirit. The redemption of the purchased possession is the new body. And as Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Love is key. And you get joy by obeying the commandments of Jesus Christ. And remember, by their fruits, you shall know them. You can tell if people have love in their hearts and love God, if they in turn love others. If they're saying they love God and they're turning around just tearing people down and, and discouraging them from believing God by how mean they are to them. Those are their fruits. By your fruits, you shall not will know them. And because it's because of a lack of love of the Lord Jesus Christ and his father, the way fell apart. So our job is to not compromise on the word. And the epistles are the commandments, and we are to love as he loved. And then Steve Armstrong talked about healing and forgiveness and hope. Hope for the future. Our future is bright. We are all God's kids. Where the mystery lives things happen. Renew your mind to what God has done, not conforming to this age. And repentance is simply a change of mind. The change comes from the inside because it's Christ in you. <clears throat> we must fill our word, minds with God's word and keep it in our minds. There are no shortcuts every day. And why should I love? Because God loves me. Be anxious for most things. No. <laughs> Only the really important things. Oh. No, be anxious for nothing. When I was in high school, we used to say, when in a fix, turn to Philippians 4, 6. <laughs> and I still remember that. I still remember that. There are days where I, I, I like anybody, 
get confused and worried and upset about things. And then I think of Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Um, and of course, the result of walking with the power of God is you operate the power of God by renewing your mind and people end up walking and leaping and praising God. So it's been a great, great weekend. It's an honor that I do not take lightly to attempt to wrap up the weekend with the final teaching. And we're going to talk about redemption. Now imagine you go into the fanciest restaurant in town. You've been dreaming about this for months. You go in and you order the biggest steak they have after getting the biggest shrimp cocktail and the biggest bowl of lobster bisque they have. And you order one of the most expensive bottles of wine. And then you get the fanciest salad and three of the most expensive desserts and then get another bottle of wine. And you've racked up this huge tab. You reach in your pocket and as I've done sometimes, your wallet's not there. <laughs> now, if you lived across town and could call your family member or best friend, that would be great. But nobody answers the phone. The manager is calling the police. You've stolen $500 from this restaurant and you're liable for it. And just as they're about to, the police are about to walk in the door, an old friend walks in. And he says, I'll pay. That's just one lunch. Imagine somebody doing that for your entire life. Acts 20, Acts 20. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath what? Purchased with his own blood. We are a purchased possession. We've been bought back. We had nothing but death and no eternal life and no help. That's all we had to look forward to until Jesus Christ gave his blood for us. Picture if you had to live like that time you got the $500 lunch and couldn't pay for it, if everything you did in life was like that. Every time you got in your car, every time you tried to eat lunch, every time you tried to do anything, you couldn't pay. And the world was crashing down on you. Jesus Christ paid for it all. He purchased us with his own blood. Wild. Let's go to Romans 3. It's up to you whether you want to go roaming around your Bible or not. I can't say. But go to Romans 3. Verse 23. Look at this. It says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are no exceptions. Now, you will meet people that will claim they are so holy. They may think they may try to make it look like they never sinned, but no, all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. So, to talk about, but, but I've noticed that Christian groups love to pick one sin they don't like and, and that they maybe don't do very much. And they say, this is the worst sin. Because we don't do that. These guys do. And then another group says, well, we may do that, but we don't do this. And because you're doing that thing, you're the worst group. And uh, it, uh, a great line somebody had that's not in the scriptures is, we hate people who sin differently than we do. Because <laughs> everybody has certain stuff that cuts themselves slack on yeah. and they think it's okay. <laughs> Maybe it is okay. But then another group, you know, does stuff they don't cut any slack on. So they're really evil. And, and Christians are always like that, going after each other. And you see it appeared on the news. You see it in person. And, and, and that's why I like to say there's two kinds of Christian groups. 
ones who focus on the sins of man, and there are plenty of those. And you can go on and on and talk all day about which sin they think is the worst and what they make a big deal about and which stuff they sort of let slide. So you can focus on the sins of man, or you can focus on the redemption we have through Christ, that he paid for our sins. I prefer to do that. I prefer to love people and teach them the word and I'll figure their lives out. Maybe I'll help them figure their lives out. Maybe they'll do it all by themselves with God. But the point is, my goal in life is not to run around and tell people what sinners they are. It's to tell them what a great savior from sin we have with Jesus Christ. Because he redeemed us. We've been redeemed. So, wait a minute. Where did my notes go? There we are. Romans 5. I'm going to actually start a few verses earlier than my notes said. Romans 5.1, as some of you may have heard me talk about in the past, is a verse that totally amazed me when I was a teenager. I've been going in the Word for about, I don't know, a few months, probably 16 or 17. And I sat down and read this verse. And I remember where I was sitting in my living room in my house, outside New York City, and I just was in shock because I had thought what sinners we are. I'd go to bed every night reciting the Ten Commandments before I went to myself, thinking where I messed up that day, <laughs> and God surely must hate me. And then I read this verse. Therefore, Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've got it. Now, plenty of people have tried to take that great, that peace away from me by telling me how badly I messed up or what I'm doing they don't like or what I'm not doing that I, they do like. And plenty of people have tried to take it away, but my peace with God has nothing to do with what I do. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing separating you and God. It's sort of like, like you were, like somebody was saying, you were. Uh, Bob was about, about how if we carry any burden, we put it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. If you think you don't have peace with God, it's because you're putting it on yourself. Mm -hmm. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, by whom we also have faith, access by faith into this law and condemnation. Oh. No, grace. Grace. God's unmerited divine favor. It's like, like there's been a lot of talk about grandkids here. We take care of little babies because we love them. It's not like they really earned much. <laughs> if they didn't do the dishes. They didn't cut the grass. Yeah. All they did was poop and drool all over you. That's, <laughs> that's what babies do. And we love them anyway. We love them anyway. Um, but it's, uh, somebody once said, long before I got in the way, somebody said, grace is, if you spell the letters out, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm. That's the nice way to explain. We get everything God has to offer at Christ's expense because he paid for it. He redeemed us. So verse two, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, verse three, but we glory in tribulations, <laughs> and mental pressure, problems, outside things trying to close in on us. We glory in them knowing that tribulation works or produces patience. Mm. You get through your mental pressures, you end up being a little more patient. I sometimes get accused of being patient. Mm -hmm. One time I was in a job where they gave me all those, those psychological tests to figure out your personality. Yeah. And so I did a bunch of them online. And then I talked to the psychologist over the phone. And her first words were, don't you ever get mad about anything? <laughs> I said, I've been doing this for years and I've never met somebody as even tempered as you are. I said, well, I get mad now and then, maybe once or twice a year, lasts about a minute or two, and then I'm over it. And that's just sort of the way I am. And uh, I don't know if it's because a lot of reading the word or just my genes, but that's the way I ended up. Not a lot upsets me uh, because I know God's going to take care of us. We glory in tribulation. I mean, tribulation produces patience. Patience produces experience. Experience produces hope. And hope makes not a shame. Because the love of God is shed to broaden our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. 
Now verse six, we'll get back on the topic of redemption. <laughs> verse six, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Aren't you glad? He didn't die for the goody two shoes because there weren't any. <laughs> Even Abraham, God countered his believing for righteousness. He wasn't perfect, but he believed God. Moses certainly wasn't perfect, but God called him faithful and the meekest man on the earth. He looked beyond things. And in the age in which we live, this is the age of grace, the administration of the grace of God. So are there things in the Bible like we re have been read to us that we should be faithful? Sure. Are there things we're supposed to do and other stuff we're not supposed to do? Sure. But what's the focus? It's not on works. It's not the administration of law. It's the administration of grace. The whole focus is God's grace. Jesus Christ has redeemed us. And by the grace of God, we have eternal life. That's the focus. So don't get wrapped up in some verse. You know, somebody over here is doing something I don't like or didn't do something he should. No, we've got to deal with that. But, you know, it's sort of like if, let's say, we we saved up all year and we're taking a trip to the beach. Well, do I want to get upset because I'm in traffic for 10 minutes? Or because I got to wait in line at the gas station? Or I go into the little convenience store and they don't have just the kind of potato chips I like? <laughs> no, because the point is, get to the beach. <laughs> Put up with all that. Well, in our administration, the point is, it's the grace of God. Oh, sure, I mess up a little here, and you mess up a little there, and we got to figure it out. But that's not the point. That's not what we focus on. It's the grace of God. We're in the administration of the grace of God. King David, did he mess up? Sure. But what did God call him? A man after God's own heart. That's God's view of David. And there are other great things it says about him. But yes, David messed up. But that wasn't God's summary of the thing. God's summary of this administration is it's the administration of the grace of God. Because Jesus Christ redeemed us. Wow. I like that. I like that. I don't like sitting around worrying about where people messed up. That happened. There's too much of that. You know, it's, it's, it's like people, you know, I've driven a lot in cities. I've lived in a lot of cities. When I retired, I'd drive Uber in cities. And people say, how can you stand the traffic? We get used to it. I've been doing it for decades. You would think about it. But my focus is not on the traffic. I don't let a little thing like that bother me because I have a bigger picture of things I want to do. And there's so many things in life. You can let that little annoyance ruin your day. But you can say that's just a little annoyance. I'm going to pray, and by the grace of God, I'm going to have a great day. I messed up, so what? My friend who said he was going to do this and crapped out on me, so what? By the grace of God, I'm going to have a great day. I better get back to my notes. I have a problem sticking to my notes. So let's go back to verse 6, Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure, maybe, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath and tribulation. We're not going through any of that wrath and tribulation in the book of Revelation. Because we've been saved from all that. And so we've been saved. Like God can say this about so many things. In the past, God, with the help of his son, Jesus Christ, paid for our eternal life. In the present, we get to enjoy that eternal life and have the gift of Holy Spirit. In the future, we'll be with the Lord. No wrath. So God's always got the past, the present, and the future taken care of. We as people tend to worry about one, two, or all three of those. <laughs> we tend to worry too much about something in the past instead of just letting it go. We tend to be too freaked out about what's going on today. Oh, this is tough. We tend to worry about today's okay, but what about next week? week after. <laughs> well, God will take care of us in our earthly bodies on the earth as long as we live. And then it'll be even better when the Lord returns. So that's what we trust. That's what we focus on. 
And it's all because Jesus Christ redeemed us. He paid us off. We didn't end up getting stuck in that restaurant, dragged off to jail because we couldn't pay for lunch. No. Our good friend walked in, took one look at it and said, I'll pay. And that was the end of the problem. And Jesus Christ didn't just pay for lunch. For everything we'll ever need for eternity. Talk about prepaid. <laughs> You've heard about prepayment plans. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a prepayment plan. It's better than a postpayment plan that you can't pay off. But, but, but the point is, he's paid for everything. Sometimes I try to get a prepayment plan where it's a good deal. So, like, pay for the extra maintenance. And sometimes they actually come through for you. A lot of times there's something in the fine print I missed and it doesn't really work. But now with Jesus Christ, it's prepaid. <laughs> Romans 6 23. Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. <laughs> so if we sinned and Jesus Christ didn't pay for them, all we'd have to look forward to is death. And it wouldn't just be death of the physical body, it'd be death like forever. By the way, here's something you all may or may not know. There's a difference in the Bible between the word die and the word perish. The word die just means you take your last breath, your body turns back to dust. Perish means you're totally obliterated, wiped out forever. That's what happens in the second death, where those that don't have eternal life go in the lake of fire. That's perishing. But for us to die and then be raised with a changed, immortal, incorruptible body, that's just dying. That's temporary. Perishing's permanent. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord tarries, we're all going to die. But because we're born again, we're not going to perish. Pretty neat. When I was uh, preparing my class on the return of the Lord and working through what Jesus Christ did, or excuse me, what Dr. World did in his wonderful book, Are the Dead Alive Now? That's one of the very few, what I would call an improvement or a, a clarification. That's one of the few things I noticed that I was able to add to it. Most of it's just what he taught. But I saw a couple of things, and a couple other things I, I was able to improve, but that's one of my favorite ones. It was there all the time. Was, nobody ever looked. At least I didn't. But <laughs> when I saw it, it was like, wow, that's so easy. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Romans 6, so the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're glad we have the gift of eternal life because he redeemed us. Go to Galatians 3. You probably know this is the one book in the Bible specifically for women. <laughs> Not actually, but it is Galatians. <laughs> it's before lunch. Got to keep you awake. <laughs> See, the good thing about groaning is it brings in a lot of oxygen. <laughs> Anything to help keep you awake till lunch. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if you ever, any of you remember watching Johnny Carson when he was on the Tonight Show. The thing that was so great about him, if he told a joke and it bombed, which happens to any comedian, he, the, his response was such that he got a bigger laugh from the way he reacted to it than the original joke would have been. I always admired that. Okay, Galatians 3.13. Christ hath what? Redeemed us from the curse of the law. Because you see, since all men sin and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, all we had to look forward to is death, the curse of the law. But he redeemed us. He bought us back from the curse of the law. He made a curse for us. Just like when our friend walked in and paid for lunch. We couldn't pay for it. He paid for it. Well, Jesus Christ, there was a curse. Somebody had to take the curse. Just like somebody had to pick up the check. Well, he took the curse. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It's a really big check. $500 for lunch. But he became a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessings of 
that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amazing. Just amazing. Uh, Galatians 4. Flip over a page. Galatians 4. In verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. So it started with the law. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son or sonship. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, which we heard about earlier in the weekend. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Isn't that great? Look at verse 5. God sent forth his son to redeem them that were under the law, to buy them back. They were under the power of the God of this world, the adversary. They had, were all sinners, and the wages of sin is death. So they were generally in a bad way. And Jesus Christ redeemed them, bought them back, that we might receive sonship. Wow. Think about if you were very destitute. Maybe you never could have afforded that lunch. And this rich benefactor comes in and not only pays your lunch, but adopts you, makes you his heir. And you're totally set for life at that point. That would be a big change in your life, wouldn't it? Well, that's what God did for us. So verse 5, to redeem them that were the, under the law that we might receive sonship. And because you're our sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That is a big change. He dead in sins and without hope in the world to be an heir of God through Christ. And you see how God took care of the past, the present, and the future. <clears throat> he paid for all our sins. And now we have sonship. We have the spirit of God. And in the future, we have our inheritance in Christ. And it's in heaven where nothing can mess with it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's because we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> the other thing we used to say in high school is Ephesians a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's good because before that, the best thing I'd ever heard was an apple a day keeps the doctor away as long as you've got good aim. <laughs> but that was when doctors made house calls. So it doesn't really apply now. Okay, Ephesians 1, verse 13. Just want to keep my young people awake. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 13. In whom? Talking about Christ from the previous verse. In Christ, you also trusted Oops, sorry about that, Ken. <laughs> I'm sabotaging my own video. Okay. Um, <laughs> in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Another verse we've read this weekend, which is the earnest of our inheritance, the down payment. It's sort of a, it's nice when somebody gives you a down payment because that shows they're serious. It's earnest money. It's showing their earnest. They really mean it. They want to follow through on the deal. Well, God's showing us he's earnest. I'm going to follow through on the deal by giving us the gift of Holy Spirit. The earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. I think it was Charlie that pointed out that's when we get the new body. Our bodies are changed. They're no longer corruptible. They're no longer mortal. They're immortal. Means they can't die. They're incorruptible. Means they can't get sick or degrade. 
we, we, we need that. And we're all going to get that. <laughs> but isn't that amazing? Uh, verse 14, that spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Uh, part of our redemption includes our sins being paid for now. It also includes ending up with the new, newly changed body. Redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Mm. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians. We've been spending a lot of time in the epistles this weekend. It's almost like it was the theme of the weekend, Steve. <laughs> that's what I thought. And we overlap <laughs> a few verses, and that's okay. Every one of these verses has a lot to it. You can take it. Colossians 1, verse... 14. Well, let's back up a little bit. Let's go to verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or adequate to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Again, we weren't adequate to be partakers of the inheritance, but through what Jesus Christ did, God made us adequate. It's like when we were at lunch and couldn't pay the bill. We weren't adequate to pay the bill. But that benefactor walked in the door and paid it for us and then adopted us made us his heir now we're adequate to be heirs of that benefactor and how much greater to be an heir of god so verse 12 giving thanks unto the father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance and the saints of light in light verse 13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness it's part of our redemption. The devil no longer has authority over us. Ever since Adam, he's been the God of this world. And unless people believe God for protection, he can do whatever he wants to anybody. But we've been delivered from the power of darkness. Amen. We've been redeemed. So, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, verse 13, hath translated us or transported us into the kingdom of his dear son, we're seated in the heavenlies. That's our position. We just haven't shown up there yet because we're still ambassadors for Christ here in this world. But you see, I've been worked in D.C. I knew a lot of foreign service people. They go spend three years in Kuala Lumpur, the embassy, then come back and spend three years living in Bethesda, Maryland, where Bob grew up. And then they'd go back and next time they would you know, be down in Buenos Aires, Argentina for three years, and then they'd go back. Well, we're on the field. We're on, we're ambassadors here, but we get to go back to headquarters later, and the true headquarters is where the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and we eventually end up in the New Jerusalem. That's where our seat, we're seated. There's a seat saved there with your name on it. It's waiting for you to get back. We're seated in the heavenlies with Christ. We'll meet him in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's amazing. So when he ends up in New Jerusalem, we'll be there with him. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so verse 13, delivered us from the power of darkness, transported us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom, verse 14, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's what our redemption is. Our sins are forgiven. When the guy walked in, the benefactor walked into the restaurant and paid the bill, that was what the redemption was. He bought us back, and the result was forgiveness of the debt, the 500 bucks for lunch. Well, that was great for lunch, but Jesus Christ <laughs> has paid for all our sins, which means we're righteous. We're right before God. There is no conflict between us and God. Our justification, justification is just a verb to make you righteous. It's the same Greek root. I'm justified means I'm made righteous. And as somebody once said, it's just as if I'd never sued. I'm justified. If somebody comes in and pays the bill, it's just as if you never owed it. Manager, restaurant manager doesn't care. Somebody paid it, it's gone. It's just as if I never ran up a debt there. Wow. So we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Um, just a couple of quick ones here to wrap up. Hebrews 9. A 
That's what a friend of mine does. He brews coffee every morning. <laughs> Sometimes tea. Sometimes tea. Uh, Hebrews 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained what? Eternal, Eternal redemption. redemption for us. He did. They used to have to sacrifice all the bloods and goats for if you've read the Old Testament, which I'm sure you have. They had sacrifices for everything. If you had a bad day and do some, did something stupid, you had to do a sacrifice for it. You know, if you, you know, you, you just sacrifices for everything. But look what, and there were bloods and goats, bulls and goats. But his was not by bull, blood, <laughs> goats and calves. I better just read it. Mm. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Imagine if that guy came in and paid off your lunch and then set up some kind of account so you're going for lunch every day and it was always paid off. Mm. Eternal. An eternal lunch tap. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't mind one. You wouldn't mind one. <laughs> <laughs> My father did that. He flew a lot on business and always flew Delta. And like Mike likes to fly. Mike James likes to fly. And, and he flew so much, they gave him a lifetime membership in the Delta Club. Wow. I took him there for the last time when he was about 94. Wow. We still got in. It still works. <laughs> and that was just the Delta Club. Imagine that for eternal life. Right. That's much better. At <laughs> any rate, uh, Eternal redemption. Verse 13, for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth for the purifying of the flesh, which it did for a time in the Old Testament. You had to do it again next year or next month. How much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience for, from dead works to serve the living God? Isn't that just amazing? Verse 15, and for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force. This is similar to what we call a will in our society. You know, you're not going to exercise somebody's will, the will while they're alive. It's set up for happen after they're dead for where a testament is verse 16 there must also necessity be the death of the testator for testament is a force after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth whereupon the first testament was dedicated with blood so jesus christ gave his blood for us first peter verse one first peter one in verse 18, for as much as ye know, we know this, First Peter 1, 18, for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain, empty conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but instead, and there are people that think they could do that, I mean, think about it in the Middle Ages, where they would pay their indulgences, one of the things that uh, Martin Luther so rallied against. And if, I, if you read medieval history, you'll find out that a lot of the nobles would pay to have a monastery in their land so all these holy men could pray for their sin, you know, the sins of the nobles, because the nobles knew they were nasty pieces of work, <laughs> running around killing everybody. So they thought if they paid for a bunch of monks to pray for them, they had a better chance of getting into heaven. And then well, their theology was a little funny. If they knew they were saved by grace, that wouldn't have mattered, but they didn't seem to know that. Same reason uh, in the Middle Ages, it was very common for anybody who had anything to do with fighting because they thought all killing was, was, was a huge sin. So the knights, the nobles, the kings, they'd all get baptized on their deathbed because they thought the only sure way to take care of your sins was to get baptized. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe anything else would work. So you wait until you're about to have your last breath and get baptized real quick, and then you die before you have a chance to sin anymore. <laughs> and all these silly things, but if they'd known the grace of God, 
And they were saved by grace and Jesus Christ redeemed them. They wouldn't have had to do all those silly things. We think they're silly to them. That was their theology. That's what they thought. Maybe somebody will look back at us in 100 years and say they were so silly. But we're trying very hard to see what the Word of God says to believe that. So, any rate, uh, for, so we were saved, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, as with a lamb without blemish and without spot. So that's how we were redeemed, not with silver and gold. Um, 1 Peter 2.24, you know, he bore our sins in his own body. By his stripes, we were healed. Let's go on to 1 John chapter 2. Sorry, Steve. It's not a church epistle, but it's still an epistle. I know. Somebody once tried to tell me. It's, it's grace. Bruce. I know. <laughs> Somebody once tried to tell me an epistle was the sister of an apostle, but I never really <laughs> believed that. <laughs> I don't know. We got to research. Got to work on that one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, First John chapter 2. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of people who will tell you that. <laughs> if any man sin, we have an advocate, a defense attorney, somebody out there fighting for us with the Father. And who is that? Jesus, Jesus Christ the righteous. Christ. Somebody pointed out this weekend that Jesus Christ is still working pretty hard. He's still seated at the right hand of God. He still makes intercession for the saints. Yeah. Who knows what else he does? Does he get coffee breaks? I don't know. No. Let's say maybe he does. It's, it's not my concern. But, uh, <laughs> it's probably between him and his father, God. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation, the payment for our sins. He's the payment for our sins. He redeemed us, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wow. And then I was going to end with Romans 8, but we've gone through that a little bit this week. So <laughs> let me just say, if God be for us, who can be against us? No you guys one, remember no that old one, cheer? No. Let's try that. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? No one, no one, no one. Yes. Because we've been redeemed. Heavenly Father, thank you for all your wonderful Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, did for us. Thank you for all you did in preparing for centuries and millennia for him and his coming and his ministry and how faithful you were to support him and his ministry and to raise him from the dead and to make available the gift of Holy Spirit through his wonderful work, love, and sacrifice. And may we continue to be living sacrifices, trusting you, believing you, walking on your word every day. And we thank you for this and the joy of fellowshipping with you, with your son, and with one another. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.